Um, thank you guys for coming back. I appreciate it. Um, so I have the honor of introducing Dr. Bill Burns. He um, has, I'll let him introduce himself to you, but he uh, also uh, is an advisory board member for our Urban and National Planning Advisory Board. Um, he works here in the city of Orlando and uh, is a graduate for our PhD program. Okay, good. I'm remembering it all correctly. Um, without further ado, I'll let him take over uh, and enjoy. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, as Claire said, I'm Bill Burns. I work full time at the City of Orlando in the Department of Public Works as a project manager. And uh, about uh, four years ago, I graduated from UCF in the PhD program, Public Affairs program. So, um, what I'd like to talk to you tonight about is a project that I worked on at the City of Orlando. Uh, it was the creation of a wetlands project. Uh, that is in the city of Orlando, and it was created for the purpose of mitigating wetland impacts with the John Young Parkway roadway project, which was constructed in the 1990s. And so as maybe, as you perhaps have discussed in the class, when you build roads or you build some type of new development and you impact wetlands or you destroy wetlands, then you have to mitigate for those impacts. And back in the 1990s, when we were building John Young Parkway, uh, we didn't have the opportunity to buy wetland credits. It's a lot easier now where you can buy wetland credits in a, an existing wetland parcel, and then you can mitigate by buying a certain amount of credits for a certain uh, dollar amount. Back in the 1990s, you were kind of on your own, and you had to find land and then mitigate on that land. You have to purchase it, and then you, you get credits for enhancement, or restoration, or creation of new wetlands. And so if you created wetlands, you got the most points. Um, in enhancement, you got the lesser number of points. So I'll talk about that project. But um, first, I have a couple warm-up slides. Has anybody been to Prague? Okay. Did you live there, or visit there, or? Um, I went backpacking when I was 19, and I went there for a day. Okay, one awesome. day. Okay. So <laughs> I was there. Deal. I was there a couple of years ago, and Claire and I were talking. And I would suggest if you have the opportunity to travel to Central or Eastern Europe, that you do so. Um, I think this is one of the best views uh, in the world, and I haven't traveled that extensively. But this is the top of uh, the one side of Prague, overlooking. The, uh, the river down below is the famous Charles Bridge, which is a pedestrian only bridge. Perhaps you walked on it. A lot of artists. Statues. statues, that's correct. And then if you come up through this area, this is Malastrank, and you come up by the cathedral here, and you continue to walk, then at the top of this area is a monastery. Mm -hmm. And the monastery, the monks make their own beer. And they also have a restaurant up there as well, so you can drink um, holy beer, and you can have some very good uh, Czech food as well. So, um, and, and this is one of the main streets in Prague. The Starbucks is down here, and the McDonald's is right here on this corner here. Um, for those of you who want uh, to maintain your American cuisine, um, this is a little bit bigger picture. And, and the area I was where those chairs were. Uh, overlooking the city of Prague was up in here. Um, the railroad station, uh, any of you who have traveled on trains also know that when you get uh, your, your time and everything, that it always changes 15 minutes before you get on the train, right? You have to look up at the board to make sure what the actual time is and what the gate is. So just uh, tips for international travel. <laughs> and if you go and work overseas for environmental type projects or something. Uh, the trains are interesting where you face each other. Um, this was a student in Dresden. He was going to the University of Dresden. Um, some of you may know that's not too far from Prague. It's about uh, maybe a two hour train ride uh, to the um, west. And uh, Dresden during the Second World War was bombed extensively towards the end of the war. It's kind of a shame because it pretty much wiped out some really amazing architecture. Um, but the Germans have rebuilt it, and it's um, somewhat of a, a great tourist place now. And then, of course, the manholes are pretty cool over there, too. So anyhow, let's get started with the, uh, the substance of, of the uh, talk tonight. So uh, part one, I'm going to talk about the Eagle Nest 
Eagle Nest wetlands area. And then I'm also going to talk about a green roof that uh, I did on fire station number number one in downtown Orlando. Have you talked about green roofs? We talked about in the beginning class. Okay, yeah. so um, you know all about green roofs or whatever, but I'll show you an example of one in an urban area in downtown Orlando. And then if we have time, uh, we'll talk about some higher level stuff, uh, planning stuff, um, how world uh, demographics are affecting the environment, ecology. Um, I heard on NPR radio this morning that they say that the rhino will become extinct in the wild within five to seven years, which is really, really a shame. And a lot of that uh, is being driven by changing demographics and uh, population pressure and uh, uh, financial interests as well. Um, and then kind of coming down from that, I'll use an example of the city of Helsinki. I had the opportunity to travel in Helsinki a couple of years ago as well. And then we'll look at bicycles. Any of you bicyclists in the room? Okay, um, good. So we have a few. And uh, personally, I, you know, I'm an advocate of bicycling, and I think it's very important that we split up the transportation modal share to incorporate bicycling because um, just like having an automobile, which is very autonomous, you can go where you want to go, when you want to go, the bicycle affords all the same type of autonomy. Um, and versus public transportation, where you have a certain schedule you have to get on, uh, meet the schedule, and you have other people to compete with, the bicycle you can come and go as you please, as long as there's good bicycle infrastructure that people perceive to be safe. And so we'll look at a couple slides on that very quickly. Okay, so starting way up above, state of Florida, and uh, so we recognize that, and then as you probably talked about in class as well, um, the St. John's River coming through here, and then um, City of Orlando. And the project that I'm going to talk about, the Eagle Nest um, Wetlands area, is a little bit west of Orlando. And it is connected to the Shingle Creek Basin. And Shingle Creek, as you, as you may know, um, in just west of Orlando is the very headwaters of the Everglades. And maybe you talked about that in class. But that um, Shingle Creek then dies down into Lake Toho, which then goes down to Lake Okeechobee. So it's kind of a unique wetlands project because it's at the very headwaters of the Everglades. So coming down a little bit further, um, City of Orlando here, and then this wetlands area is right here. So it's a little bit southwest of Orlando. And then drilling down a little bit further, Pine Hills, downtown Orlando is here. And then this is the wetlands area right in here. And so uh, this road right here is Metro West Boulevard Extension. And then running north and south is the new President Barack Obama Parkway. And maybe some of you have an opportunity to, um, to be out there and drive on this new road. But north of Metro West Boulevard Extension is roughly 200 acres. And then south of it is a little bit more than 200 acres. A little bit further, then we're coming down onto the property here. Here's uh, President Barack Obama Parkway, Metro West Boulevard. And so this is what we did. Um, when we constructed John Young Parkway, which was a little bit to the west of this area here, as I mentioned, we had to find property to mitigate for the wetland impacts that we had on John Young Parkway. And we had approximately 26 acres of impacted wetlands that we had to go right through. And so we destroyed those wetlands to build the roadway. Now, um, the good thing about it is those wetlands were not huge wetland areas. They were smaller remnant wetlands that had already been chopped up somewhat. And so the damage the, in the bigger picture wasn't as great. But nonetheless, there were wetlands in their habitat uh, homes for um, you know, different types of birds and whatnot. So we had the, um, this was Lake Fran area, which was an existing area. Uh, Lake Man, which is a little bit to the west, that whole drainage basin drains into Lake Fran. And then uh, Clear Lake, which is to the west as well, that drains into this Lake Fran area. And then this is Carver Shores neighborhood, and that drains into this area as well. 
So this whole area, and you can see on a, another slide, um, a lake was constructed in here in order to obtain some additional volume. And as you may know, for stormwater, when you treat stormwater, you have to treat the first flush, which is the dirty stuff coming off the road. And you have to kind of hold that. And then the second amount of water is the volumetric, or the attenuation. Because when you build stuff, then you have created more impervious land, right? So when the rain hits asphalt versus ground, then it hits and it's going to run a lot quicker. So the time of concentration, the time for when it comes down and hits that pavement to when it runs to an outfall is a lot quicker when you have impervious type of surface, like an asphalt, like a brick or something. So the, uh, you have this water handler effect where the water is getting to a point very quickly and you have to attenuate it to the precondition. And the way you attenuate it is you create this bathtub, more or less, where you have this volume and it runs into this, this area, this pond or something, and it holds the water and then it comes out of this basin or this retention pond, actually it's a detention pond, at the same flow as what the original flow was before you built the project. Does that make sense? Maybe you've talked about it somewhat. But that's the overarching um, re requirement, permit requirement. That's what civil engineers do when they do site design, is that you have to uh, manage the stormwater and you're required to maintain the preconditioned flow off the site. The way you do that is either through ponds that are visible or you do it underground, and I'll show you what we did on Fire Station 1, where you don't have a whole lot of available space in urban areas, so you do it underground. Provided the groundwater table isn't too high. If it's too high, then you don't have that ability to have an underground vault system because it's already saturated. So there's other things you have to do that. So um, the way this was designed then with these inputs coming into this area is that this area here we split up into three cells. And with a lot of things, you really don't try to fight the land or you don't try to fight you know, an existing system. You try to understand the system and then you model that and you try to work with it so that it works within itself. And so we identified what the, what the land was. This area down in here was predominantly cypress trees and they were in pretty good shape but they needed some more water. Uh, whereas this area that we called cell two was a lot of bad invasive type species that really didn't have any reason to be there. And then cell three was a lot of the same, but that afforded us the opportunity to gain a lot of the volume that we needed. So that's where we did most of the earth work. So this, this is a, an aerial, um, and this is Lake Fran, and here you can see that we dug out a big portion of this. And so I'm looking, this is going south, all right? So President Barack Obama Boulevard is now right through here. And then this is Metro West Boulevard Extension. And if you've been out there, there's a school here now. So this area here then flows into this area. This is called uh, cell number three, cell number two. And then this is the area where the existing Cypress area was, and that's cell number one. So the game plan was, we said, well, we'll take the water from here into here, and it will go to cell number three, and it will then also will have pop-off structures between the cells, such that this wetland then will hydrate, and it will invigorate the existing Cypress trees. And then in here, we did a lot of excavation in this uh, aerial here. We started to do some of the excavation, but it wasn't. Uh, this was when we were in progress. So just in that, another larger picture, you can see some of the progress that was made in Lake Fran, and then it goes into the different cells down here. And then right here, it pops off, and then this is Shingle Creek right here. So the idea is that the water coming in, the phosphorus and the nitrogen loading, which, um, or the organic matter um, type of loading coming in, you want to reduce that. And so thus far, the project uh, from the monitoring, from the point of entry to the output, um, it is performing fairly well, but we're not really sure. Um, it's not performing as well as what we would like it to. And building wetlands, and any time that you work with the land, 
move dirt around and uh, are working with water and everything. It, it's you know it's it's not going to be exactly the way you, that you design it. So you have to kind of work with it and monitor it and uh, then make adjustments as you move through the through the project. So um, here's some of the digging that we did in cell number three. And so the idea was to do a lot of earthwork to bring down the ground so that when we planted cypress trees, the cypress trees would be in the, the high groundwater table. As you know, cypress trees like water and, and they can't be too far from water. So the only way to uh, construct an environment for a cypress area would be to dig out the land and then bring it down. And I guess you've talked about the uh, Orlando wetlands, perhaps, mm -hmm. or you. Yeah, where are we going? What's that? You going out there? Yeah, where are we going? Okay, yeah. yeah, it's it's fantastic. And in fact, when you go out there, I was out there uh, last weekend, and one particular cell, and it's the same concept, mm -hmm. you know, only they have more cells, and they move the water through more, you know, progression from the wastewater treatment plant through the wetland onto the St. Johns River. But this is the same idea, only we're doing it within an urban area through this filter to Shingle Creek. But they're doing a lot of excavation in one of those cells out there too, and they're bringing it down in order to plant cypress trees to uh, engage the hydrology. So when we monitor it, uh, we have an a, uh, input here with Lake Man, which is the outfall from Lake Man, uh, the outfall from Clear Lake, uh, Carver Shores comes in. Uh, this is the school that's now developed. We monitor it here at Lake Fran outfall into pond number three. This is um, actually this is pond three, pond two, and then pond or cell number one down here. But it moves through this filter, and so hopefully we're getting benefit. That the water coming in when it goes out is better, and at the same time we're creating a wetland that is a good functioning wetland with more trees, and, and so we have benefit in the environment. And the other thing is too is that we've taken it off the market for future development. So within the city of Orlando, we've maintained a rather extensively large green area of about 400 acres, which is a good thing. Um, moving on to the uh, fire station project, um, have any of you been downtown and see fire station number one? Okay. Can, can I pause you for a second? Sure. Any questions on the reconstructed wetland? Do you uh, mind? Yes, yeah. no, good idea. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this already, but what's the, for the monitoring aspect? What yeah. type of equipment are you, are you utilizing to do that? Well, I can um, I can tell you this that um, I'm in public works, so I, I don't want to say it's not my job. But <laughs> it's <not> my job. <laughs> um, I was the project manager who uh, uh, facilitated the design and actually came up with the some of the ideas involved with doing this. We did a lot of the design in house, um, and it was really as you, um, the, the driving force for this project originally was we had to build Johnny Parkway. And Johnny Parkway was the primary focus. And then in order to build it, we were destroying wetlands, so we had to go find mitigation. And so this property, you know, availed itself. And so, but the focus still is building the road. And so we did what we needed to do to tie up the land, do some mitigation, but our focus really wasn't on creating this wonderful wetland area. On the other side, at the Orlando Wetlands Park for the city of Orlando, the focus very early on was to build this beautiful wetland, and that's what it is. This um, eagle nest has evolved over time, so um, the, the folks who monitor it, it's a different division within public works, and it's called stormwater streets and stormwater. And so, um, it's kind of interesting because the project was permitted and then you have to demonstrate that it is working substantially according to permit for four years and then you're off the hook, at least the permitting at the time. So when we were off the hook, then budget priorities or whatever went elsewhere and we kind of just sat there for a while. <laughs> but what is bringing this back up, what's driving this again, is the President Barack Obama Parkway because there is limited availability along that corridor to buy, to obtain vacant land for retention, detention ponds. And so this property, the Eagle Nest property, is a wonderful opportunity because there's a lot of available capacity volume there that's either existing or it's available in cell number three where you can dig that down. 
And so the city now all of a sudden has got a lot more interest. So the monitoring has recently picked up because in order to do this, we have to go back, and I'm, I'm not involved with this, but I'm talking to, to those guys. Um, they have to go back and demonstrate the existing function of it, and then come up with a clear, clear game plan as to how we may incorporate and run off from the northern sections of the parkway which have yet to be constructed. It will tie into the winter park. Uh, uh, but I can tell you this, if you want to find out exactly, I can um, give you, you know, name or phone number or whatever, and you can yeah, that'd be great. talk My, to my research kind of focuses or centers around uh, Stormwater Basins. So just, okay. I mean, I know you're, it's wetlands, but I can yeah. kind of clean up some of Well, if you want to jot down, the, the uh, person's name is Lisa Lotti, and she's at the uh, City of Orlando Streets and Stormwater uh, Division. <clears throat> okay. And I spoke to her uh, on one, one occasion uh, about a week or so ago, and she has another person who actually does a lot of the monitoring um, for her. So she'd be the best contact. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Yes? Um, the other thing that we talked about today was the definition of restoration. And I was wondering in public works when it comes to projects like that or other projects that you're related to, um, what would your definition of restoration be? Well, I think that, um, you know, restoration, at least when I was involved in this, uh, restoration was only possible if a wetland was not so far degraded that it was still possible to restore it. And <clears throat> restoring it involves uh, addressing the hydrology and addressing the plantings. And a lot of times, uh, at least on this parcel, the existing wetland plantings were so far all these invasive, invasive species had moved in and everything, primarily because the hydrology had changed. And so when the water table, you know, is affected, it drops because of different things that are being done off-site um, through ditches and drainage and whatnot, then it affects that wetland. And that's what happened. Um, so, um, you know, we got credit for restoring some wetlands, and then I think we even got a, a small uh, credit for some creation of wetlands. So back then, they don't allow us anymore. But back then, you could actually take an upland and you could manipulate the, the groundwater table through what you did off-site in the water coming in, and you could create wetlands in upland areas. But the, the management, water management district, uh, finally kind of got wise to that because they had this whole plethora of projects that with created wetlands that really didn't work so well. And so they've really gotten away from that, and now they're all about enhancement, restoration, and then also primarily just identifying large tracts of wetlands that they want to preserve. And they want to take off the market forever. And so that's where they have these mitigation banks. And they, they make it so much easier um, than what we had to go through. But it's good that it came out because we have an opportunity to preserve 400 acres in the city of Orlando. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, the uh, fire station project, uh, downtown Orlando, some, some of you have seen it. Um, it's uh, fire station number one, so it's the biggest fire station in Orlando. It's the primary, it's where the chief sits. His office is uh, up in here. So uh, you can look out over Central Boulevard. And um, uh, originally it was a Lynx bus station. So um, somewhat interesting, I don't know how this uh, relates directly to your class in, in uh, environment here, environmental planning. But it's kind of a good thing um, because I think the template, the principle is similar. Um, this is what we, the city, endeavored to do. And this is a vertical mixed use project where we would have the fire station, four floors uh, on the bottom, and then above it would be commercial office space. So from what we understand, I think there's like three or four in the whole country that have done this. But in urban areas where the real estate is so valuable that you want to glean all the air rights that are available on that particular parcel. Um, unfortunately, the city did a few things out of order. And unfortunately also, while we were doing things out of order, the, um, and, and I'll mention how that kind of went down, the market Tanked too. This was around 2007, 2008. So um, originally the city said, "Hey, we need a we need to build a fire station." 
The new fire station was driven by the Orlando Performing Arts Center, which is built, being built uh, on the east side of City Hall. Uh, perhaps you've seen that as well. Uh, it's supposed to open no in November. But that on that land, part of the land that they needed to construct that was the old fire station number one. So there was a time clock that we had to build a new fire station. So city went out, um, hired a design builder, solicited for a design builder that would do the design and the construction all in one. I'm not sure if you're talking about procurement and uh, how to deliver projects, but it's the same method for you know, uh, hardscape as it is for environmental projects too. Um, so uh, anyhow, we got a design build contractor and then the economic development folks, um, and I wasn't involved at, at that time, so. Um, but it, it's a good lesson to learn. The city came back and said, well, wait a minute. You're only gonna build four stories. You know, hey, you know, you can build up to 18 stories on this parcel. We own it. Let's get some value out of this. So let's rent the air rights. So all that empty space above, if we just built four stories, has value. And it has value just like you go rent your apartment or whatever. And so, um, because you can build, and that's revenue generating space there. So then the city solicited for a developer, and the developer came up with this plan here, and so we were going to augment the two uses, which can be kind of tricky, not a whole lot of case studies as to how to do it, 